Ninjago is a show that allows for endless possibilities. It allows our characters to explore a variety of worlds and locales, meet a ton of fun and interesting characters, and go on a plethora of exciting and epic adventures. And out of all the worlds that the ninja have gone to over the years, Prime Empire is definitely one that stands out to me. And while it isn't necessarily one that's connected to one of the 16 realms, it's one that allows for so many outlandish concepts and ideas. A world where anything the writers want to happen, can happen. And in concept, this world is magnificent, but it's the execution that really matters. Prime Empire is a season that many fans of the show think highly of. It's a season that's no stranger to high praise, but today we look at the season with a more analytical eye. It's important to understand, however, that Prime Empire isn't a season made with the intention of drastically affecting the world of Ninjago. It's not really a season that's heavily connected to the lore of the show, however, this doesn't alleviate all criticism. Many fans point to Prime Empire as being a season that's just meant to be for fun, so we really shouldn't be taking it too seriously, right? While Prime Empire is a season that indeed does not need to be taken seriously, it doesn't mean it can't still be criticized, because in my opinion, while Prime Empire is a really cool and unique season, it overall leaves a lot to be desired. The following review of Prime Empire is not meant to bash the show or convince you to not enjoy the season. It's merely to share my opinion on the season in what I hope is a fun and interesting way. I'll also be sharing positives within this video because I do not believe that Prime Empire is a bad season of Ninjago, nor do I think it's a bad season of TV in general. So without further ado, I do have one question asked before we begin. Would you like to enter Prime Empire? In this season, we see the mechanic attempt to steal a motherboard that he needs to activate Prime Empire, and attempts to bring the game into the real world. Jay gets trapped in the game and the ninja, well, except Zane, go into the game to try and find him. Once they find Jay, they learn that they must get the three katanas in order to reach Unagami, who they believe to be the creator of the game known as Milton Dyer. While the ninja are in the game, Zane and Pixel find Milton Dyer and learn that he isn't Unagami, but Unagami is the game itself. By the time all three katanas make their way to Unigami, Jay is the only ninja remaining within the game. Jay goes to confront Unigami, they break out into the real world, and then Jay talks about how he's adopted, and Melton Dyer talks to Unigami, and he turns into a kid, and the end. Of course, I missed a lot of details, but that's the basic plot of Prime Empire. With this being a video game season, there's a lot of tropes that this falls into, such as our main characters being trapped in the game and having to escape while meeting a bunch of NPCs and other players along the way. It's something that's been done a ton in media already. Same with the villain's plot of trying to bring the game to life. It really isn't anything new, which already makes the premise of the season a little weak. But hey, I can overlook this as long as the world of Prime Empire is interesting enough and the execution is solid enough to warrant the basic and cliche plot of the season. So let's get into the execution. Something I noticed right off the bat with this season is its pacing. The season starts fast and doesn't really take much time to slow down. We go from plot point to plot point with barely any breathers. Usually in Ninjago we get an introduction that slowly eases us into things, allowing us to readjust with our characters and get a feel for the vibe of the season. But this season throws us right in. This isn't too big of a deal, but it does feel slightly jarring, especially with the 11 minute episode format. Once we get into Prime Empire, however, the pacing slows down a bit to help introduce us to this new world that we now find ourselves in. The show does a good job of introducing us to the world of Prime Empire. It sets up some ground rules and introduces us to the concepts of skill trees, double jumps, and limited lives in a way that feels natural and not forced. Everything for the most part makes sense, and the rules are kept consistent. The limited lives in particular add a good amount of stakes to the season, making a lot of scenes feel more tense due to the fact that the ninja could lose one of their lives at any second. Though, I feel like the season didn't use the concept to the best of its advantage, having many of the ninja lose their lives in super fast and anticlimactic ways. Soon, we get introduced to the League of Jays, which shows how fun and creative this world can be. We also meet Scott, which is a character that I'll get more in detail with later. The ninja eventually find Jay, and the next episode is all about a new character named Akino. Now, I don't have much of an issue with this episode, though it does feel a little repetitive. Akino is an entertaining character, and it makes sense to have an episode to set him up. However, the way this episode ends is what really bothers me. At the very end of this episode, we see the ninja come through with brand new suits, and the next episode, Nia says that they are here to collect the three Kitanas and reach Unagami. 
Where did they learn this? When did they get new suits? What was the point of having the ninja lose their skills when they seem to have just unlocked a bunch off screen? When did they get these weapons? The fact that none of this is shown to the audience makes me feel like I missed something. It feels like a part of the story is missing. And a ton of important plot points are skipped over in favor of having an episode all about a character that disappears from the story in a few episodes. Nia just kind of says the plot of the season with no explanation as to how they learned about this or why they're doing it, and I think it would have been a lot better to have the Okina episode be replaced with an episode where the ninja learn about the katanas and upgrade their skill tree. Don't get me wrong, Okino's episode is fun, but it doesn't really serve much of a purpose to the overall plot. Yes, it helps set up his arc, but other than that, it's not overall that important. Skipping over major plot details like the katanas and brand new upgrades and suits and stuff is kind of a big deal, especially when you're trying to get me in invested into the story. I already don't really care about the quest for the katanas because it wasn't presented to me in an interesting way, and very little context is given to me as to why this is the goal for the season. All we know is that the ninja need them to get to Okina. So off starts the adventure for the three katanas. So we get to see the ninja travel with Okina to get the first katana. And I gotta say, this whole set of episodes just kind of feels really slow and makes the pacing of the season come to a screeching halt. We spend three episodes, including the Okina one, in this part of the world, with the Okina episode already showing us most of what it has to offer, making the episodes where we see the ninja traverse this land seem like a slower reach out of what we've already seen. That's not to say nothing interesting happens in these episodes, but this part of the season always kind of sticks out to me in my mind as being a little bit boring. But the best parts of these episodes has to be Okino. I like how they explore the idea of him coming to terms with the fact that he's just an NPC in a fake world, even if it's pretty surface level. The idea is cool, and Okino isn't the only character to have his place in Prime Empire tested. A lot of what people like about Prime Empire is the side characters. So far, Scott's intro was solid, and Okino has been a wonderfully fun character to have tag along, even if I'm not a huge fan of the episodes he appears in. I'm also really glad that he decided to continue to help the ninja, despite Unigami telling him that if he betrayed them, he could see the outside world. It's actually a nice twist on a common backstabber cliche. Oh, and speaking of Unigami, we finally get to see him for the first time. I really like the scene because it sets up how powerful and threatening this guy is. He literally controls everything in the game, and his dominance over Prime Empire is clear. But, of course, more on Unigami later in the video. Overall, Okino is great and one of the better side characters from Prime Empire, but there are other side characters as well, such as Racer 7. She, like Okino, is an NPC that is familiar with failure. She is tasked to race in the Speedway 5 billion, but is programmed to lose. Not knowing this though, she continues to race anyway in hopes of maybe one day winning first place. However, Lloyd is able to inform Racer 7 about the fact that everything she knows is fake and that she is programmed to lose. It's practically the same story that they did with Okino, but it has a small amount of emotional weight behind it as opposed to the more comedic tone that we had with Okino, which really begs the question, did we need two of practically the same arc twice with two different characters? If the point of these side characters are to give us different arcs that we can't have with our main cast of ninja, then why are there two characters with practically the same arc? I feel like Okino or Racer 7 could have been cut or changed for something different, especially since five episodes in total are spent focusing on these characters. And then we have Scott. Oh, Scott. Scott's deal is that he wants nothing to do with the race. He isn't willing to risk his final life for anything or anyone. Well, at least for a little bit, until he randomly decides that he's fully willing to risk his life for the ninja. Now, this would be fine if he had some development, or if there was something that he had experienced that made him change his mind, but nope. He just goes from not wanting to risk his life to literally dying for the ninja in an instant. And it comes out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. You guys can be heroes if you want, not me. Time to try that hero thing. And it's a shame too, because I like Scott as a character, and it would have been cool to see him get some further character development, but all we get is a super rushed arc that really just comes out of nowhere for the sake of a dramatic moment that wasn't at all earned. The point of having dramatic moments like character sacrifices are to pay off buildup. Usually when a character sacrifices themselves, it's the payoff for character development. But in Scott's case, it falls flat because there is no buildup. There is no development. So now we move on to the actual Speedway 5 billion race, and I gotta say, this is probably a really personal take here, but I don't think it's a very entertaining race to watch. When you have a race in a show or movie, for me it's really important that the viewer always has an idea of where our protagonist is in the race. 
And at the end it's very clear, but for the majority of the race, it's just kind of the ninja racing rats on a straight pathway and you never really get a good sense of who's in the lead. Sure, the announcer says it like in the middle once and at the end, but other than that, you really never have a good idea of where they're placing, which can make it kind of hard to follow and kind of difficult to get invested in. I want to be able to almost always visualize where our protagonists are in the race. It's like watching a chess game as someone who doesn't know how to play chess. You don't really know who's winning. You weren't able to clearly visualize it at all times unless someone occasionally lets you know. So you're not really able to get fully invested. I will say there are some cool action set pieces, but it does feel a little dragged out. It lasts a little too long for my liking. It really only becomes exciting at the end as we get good payoff for Racer 7's arc. And speaking of Racer 7's arc, it's very similar to Scott's in the way that it feels pretty rushed. It's not as bad as Scott's, but all it really took was a pep talk from Lloyd for Racer 7 to realize what was happening and immediately overcome it but the actual presentation of Racer 7's dramatic moment and eventual victory is done much better. While well, both Scott and Racer 7 have rushed arcs, we got to at least learn more about Racer 7 and how she failed the race over and over again. We get to see Lloyd inform her on the world around her, but the turnaround from losing every race to suddenly going against her code to win doesn't really make much sense to me. If she's programmed to lose, how does knowing that information allow her to win? It would make sense if she was told her entire life that she could never win and lost faith until it was regained by her talk with Lloyd, but that's not exactly what happened. She just somehow goes against the game's code and wins, despite the fact that she literally is programmed by the game and Unagami to lose every time. It just doesn't really make much sense to me. I get that they want to push the message of believing in yourself, but surely they could have done it in a way without making me question the logic of the world building. When you have a season that's set in one specific world, the logic needs to stay consistent. Having an NPC be able to break their code just because of a pep talk from a random stranger she just met starts to hurt my immersion of the world. Prime Empire is a world with endless possibilities, but the world also has to make sense with what has been presented, and the characters have to feel like a real part of the world. Okino feels pretty real because he doesn't have a rushed arc or characterization. He feels like an actual NPC that has been told that he is living a lie and will do anything to help his new friends. Scott and Racer7, however, don't really feel like real characters. I understand that Racer 7 is an NPC, but so is Okino, and like I said, he feels realistic. Racer 7 feels like she was put in just to serve the plot and to spread the message of believe in yourself. And then you have Scott, who is a real person, but feels more like an NPC than the actual NPC characters due to his flawed logic and sudden change of heart that feels forced and has no buildup. Prime Empire is supposed to make me care for these side characters, but I can't when most of them don't feel like actual characters, but just plot devices. So then you're left with the ninja, which don't have any arcs of their own. Now, this would be fine if the arcs of the side characters were fully fleshed out, but like I've been saying, they aren't. Even Okino's only scratches the surface. But okay, we don't need amazing character arc every season as long as the ninja gets something to do, but here they just kind of feel like they're going through the motions, reacting to whatever's happening around them. Not to mention, most of them just end up dying without serving the plot in any major way. Kai and Cole just kind of tag along until the season decides that they don't need to be there anymore. They don't add anything besides some fun banter, and they both get cubed at the same time during the race. Sure, they sacrifice themselves so the rest of the protagonists can win the race, but it comes out of nowhere. Zane doesn't even get to be in most of the season, but I got to admit, his new R episode was some of the funniest stuff I have seen from this show. Then we have Lloyd, who has the talk with Razor 7, which I really like, and his rematch with Harumi was probably my favorite scene in Prime Empire. It has amazing animation and shows just how amazing Wild Brain is with animating fight scenes, but then of course he gets cubed right after. Okay, okay, sure. Lloyd did some good stuff this season. He served his purpose, it's time to have Jay and Nia have their moments before the season ends. Oh, okay, so right when we get to the perfect opportunity to have some good Nia and Jay moments, we get a drawn out sushi battle, and then Nia gets cubed. Right before the climax of the season. Well, okay, okay. It's a Jay season after all, which, yeah, by the way, this is supposed to be Jay's season. Has he really done much of anything up until this point other than geek out over video games and become a rock star? No, not really. During the final two episodes of the season is the first and only time we get character focus for Jay in the entire season. And what does Jay do in the finale? Well, he has an awesome mecha dragon fight scene, 
Look, the scene is awesome, the animation is amazing, and I understand what they're trying to do, but I just wish we had more focus on Jay and Unagami so that this fight could feel earned and actually mean something. Same with the final confrontation. I understand what they're trying to do, but if you want this to mean something, we have to have it built up throughout the entirety of the season because it just comes out of nowhere. It just doesn't have much of an impact due to the lack of focus we have had for both Jay and Unagami. And speaking of Unagami, let's finally talk about him. Like I said earlier, Unigami's introduction scene is super cool. It really sets up how powerful this guy could be, and this is the first time that this season was able to really hook me into the plot. But here's the problem. That moment was quite a few episodes into the season. Before this proper villain introduction, we heard his name a few times and his voice like once, so already the villain is being introduced a little late at this point. And to add on to that, he doesn't show up again until the last two episodes. So for the majority of the season, this guy's just been waiting for the mechanic to open up the portal while occasionally sending red visors to prevent the ninja from winning the game and reaching him. This guy can control the entire game. Heck, he is the game. I think it would have been awesome to see him distort reality of the game in attempts to stop the ninja. You know his introduction scene where he literally projects himself into the sky? Why didn't he do that more often? He doesn't have to ever leave the chamber since having him stay there makes total sense and makes the payoff for Jay meeting him greater but we have seen that he has ways to show up without going anywhere due to his earlier projection. And again, we learn that Unagami literally is the game itself. Yep, the only thing he does is send red visors after the ninja. He never makes really any other attempts to stop them until Jay confronts him. His plan makes sense, his motivation is clear, but he's barely an actual threat, making him a pretty weak villain. And the way his motivation and plan is revealed to us is from other characters for the most part. Though he does have some pretty good dialogue with Jay in the final two episodes. It's just sad that a lot of his evil plot was just given to us through exposition from the mechanic or Milton Dyer and whatnot. I will say the reveal that Unigami is the game itself was really cool, but they revealed it so late that they couldn't really do much with that concept. I also really like how Unigami feeling abandoned by Milton Dyer is paralleled with how Jay is adopted, but again, it's another interesting part of the season that's barely expanded upon. If the whole season was focused around the connection of Jay being adopted and Unigami being abandoned, I think they would have made for a way more interesting season, but it seems like the season was more interested in showing off new side characters and action-packed video game reference filled set pieces than actually telling a compelling story with the villain and what is supposed to be our main lead for the season Jay. And I just kind of find that disappointing since the ideas for the season are great, but they never get the room to breathe. There are a bunch of ideas here, but none of them really get the chance to be fully expanded upon before moving on to the next idea. It makes the season feel very disconnected and kind of all over the place. It's a bunch of disconnected payoffs with no buildup. The ideas of being an NPC in a fake world, being abandoned by your maker, hiding away for years in order to keep your last life, finding your friend after they've been trapped in a futuristic game world, all these ideas are great, but none of them get the chance to be fleshed out. I think if the writers were to pick just one of these ideas to base the entire season around, I think it would have made for a much more compelling story. It really does seem like the writers were trying to fit too many different ideas into a single season. Too many disconnected plotlines that weren't given the proper room to breathe. Combine that with stop and go pacing problems, weak characterization and arcs, and drawn out action set pieces and you're left with a season that just feels kind of disappointing. And while this may sound extremely harsh towards the season, I do still think that it can be a fun watch. The dialogue is great as always, there's a lot of good jokes, and while I believe some of the action sequences drag on a bit too long, there's a lot of variety to keep it entertaining. Not to mention the animation in Prime Empire is stellar, with some of the best fight scenes the show has ever seen. All the worlds look amazing and distinct, the character designs are super creative, but everything I like about the season is mostly from a visual standpoint. So while it's a super fun season to look at, for me, the writing holds it back, and even more so knowing that there's another season that does what Prime Empire tries to do, but just a lot better in my opinion.
Master of the Mountain is very similar to Prime Empire in a lot of ways. We see our ninja travel to a fantastical land as our main character is trapped and must be found. We see a new and interesting world with many different locales. We see a plethora of side characters and ideas at play as our main character must make their way to the villain. But what makes Master of the Mountain work so much better is it's able to tell a focused story. The story of Cole learning about his past and trying to live up to the expectations of his mother is at the forefront of the season. Not to mention the main villain, the school sorcerer, is shown early and his plans and motivations become more clear as the season progresses. The villain is an actual threat and takes action throughout the season, and on top of that, almost all of the ninja get something to do, and affect the plot in some way, shape, or form. As well as there being a ton of fun side characters that actually get to be fleshed out, and action set pieces that for the most part serve their purpose and don't drag on or feel out of place. It takes what Prime Empire wanted to be and presents it in a much more complete and satisfying way. It has everything that you could love about Prime Empire. The side characters, the antics, the fantastical world, more self-contained story, amazing animation, and thrilling action set pieces. But on top of that, it has a compelling and consistent story to tell. I don't hate Prime Empire, but it's a season that I feel falls short of what it could have been. It presents us with a world that has endless possibilities for interesting and compelling stories that the season just doesn't really seem interested in telling. It's a fun season with lots of heart, but it lacks the depth that I've come to respect Ninjago for having. Ninjago at the end of the day is a kid's show, but rarely does it ever fall into the storytelling pitfalls that kids' media often does. So when we get a season that lacks fleshed out stories and characters, that truth becomes all the more clear. Thank you guys so much for watching my review on Prime Empire. Let me know what you guys think about my review. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I have a feeling a lot of people are not going to agree with this video, but I wanted to give my full thoughts, I wanted to be honest about it, and I wanted to critique something for a change. I've been doing a lot of praising on this channel, but I wanted to give something a good, hard critique and look at it with an analytical eye. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts on Prime Empire in the comments below. Again, thank you guys so much for all the support that you've been giving on this channel. As I'm recording this, we're almost at 3,000 subs. I appreciate it so much. Thank you guys. I love the comments. I appreciate the support, and you guys are awesome. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day, and goodbye.